Joining me today on the Uniweb interview show, Jamin Chavez, author of Freedom and the Will to Move Forward, A Compass for Today's World. Also, uh, you run the PPHC.com, which is your website, and you build websites as well. Jamin, thanks so much for coming on, man. No problem. Thanks, Matt. My pleasure. Um, so let's talk about the book. We were talking a little bit about it before uh, we started recording. Freedom and the Will to Move Forward, A Compass for Today's World. Um, what's the book about? Basically, the book is about the philosophy of transcendentalism. Okay. And people might be familiar, they might or might not be familiar with Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Mm -hmm. And basically back in the 1800s, they were the most well-known transcendentalist philosophers. Henry David Thoreau wrote essays on civil disobedience, uh, Walden, and Emerson wrote essays on things such as the American Scholar and, uh, let's see, The Circle. And so, also the book, I include new ways of thinking according to the philosophies of transcendentalism called the principle of the sphere and i also draw on some of my experiences all the way from uh, my childhood which be, which is a portion of the beginning of the book okay. to sort of help people understand that me the author has gone through some of the same things that a lot of people might have been might be going through today in our modern day and I compare and contrast Ralph Waldo Emerson's and Thoreau's essays with the Declaration of Independence. And I also explain some of the current events that have been going on in the past two or three decades. And I clarify how some of those philosophies and ideologies have been warped over the decades by certain groups. Right. And let's see, and I also provide inspiration and thought provoking ideas of how we can, as the book title of the book states, we can move forward as a nation to help repair a lot of the things that have gone, gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So the idea of transcending a thought process, basically, and in, in, the, in the book, you're kind of going about it. In terms of societal norms, uh, in terms of politics, in terms of what you've seen through, you're an army veteran as well, correct? Yep. So, from your perspective of how things have worked uh, throughout the course of your life, transcending that reality. Right. Right. Um, and we talked about this a little bit before too about the awakening. Like you were talking, like we like we said that there's a consciousness building in all of us. Um, that there's something else that we're we're there's an illusion that we're being tricked into seeing, right? In a way. Um, now you you take a perspective on this uh, from a political standpoint, and I will say that I have zero clue on politics. I don't watch the news ever. Um, <laughs> just a disclaimer here: I'm not into politics at all. Uh, so you may be saying some things that are over my head when it comes to that, but I, I, I do want to, I, I want you to feel free to share your opinion on and, and what you've written about, uh, in, in the book about this. Sure. Well, I, I chose philosophy to explain a lot of these things because I had, I had years and years to think about what I wanted to write. I wasn't really planning on writing a book. It just kind of grew out of something I used to say whenever I was in the army. Mm -hmm. I, I remember I used to be having a, a, a really bad day and one of my fellow NCOs or somebody would, would walk up to me and ask me how things were going. And I really did not have a, I, I usually didn't have time to explain to him. And so I'd say, well, let me tell you, I could write a book. Yeah. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> excuse me. So years later, in September of last year, was whenever I published the book mm -hmm. that 
I was able to put everything together. And that started out as sort of a, a hobby. And then I started getting into and understanding the independent author platform and what independent authors do, you know, pretty much the, uh, the whole indie author, indie publisher business. Right. And as the, the time went on, I, I realized that it's something that I really love to do. I also love teaching. And I also love helping people. I guess you could say the best way to explain it is I get the most satisfaction whenever I am able to help somebody do something or accomplish something for themselves that they might not have been able to to do otherwise. Absolutely. And that's another one of the purposes for my book is to help people decide for themselves the type of information that they receive. Mm -hmm. And because compared to today from the 50s, 60s, or 70s, we have a lot more information available to us at our fingertips. And I realized that people don't always know what to do with that information. And yeah. if you're not prepared to deal with that information and you can't separate the difference between conventional, notable, and credible wisdom, which I explain in my book, then the, all the information out there will pretty much sweep you away like a tidal wave. Yeah, it becomes overwhelming. Right. Yeah. Or in other ways, like uh, a tornado. Yeah. And so I... You, you, you allow it to tear your life apart, basically. By by information you can't process, right? Yeah. And if you don't know what to do, you become kind of one of those gray people, or what I call a, a mindless follower, or an other, you know, yeah. because you 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 allow not knowing what to do, mm. you allow the information and the people that do know what's going on to influence and control your life. And with all the information and a lot of people, they have, they have accounts on different websites. A lot of people, they do online shopping, they stream video and media. And if you don't know what to do with information, you in essence, replace your own individuality with the information. And so you begin to be looked at as something other than what you really are. And the information that you use and take in. And so another purpose of the book. It's like is, we're building we're building digital personas on online, basically. Like in the whole in the ethereal realm of online, a mat exists other than this one. From all my shopping data, from all the tweets I've sent out, from the news stories I've read. All that data has been collected and accumulated to build a mat. Other than what you Other know than yourself to be. Know myself to be, right. Right. Yeah. And so, I, before I published the book, I realized that there were a lot of things wrong. And so I set out to figure out how I could articulate and explain these things to people. And it took me a while to figure out for myself. Yeah. And when I began to develop my own processes and methods of sort of plowing through all of these things or using what, like I said, the principle of the sphere Mm -hmm. and going off road, whenever I find it necessary. Uh, When I began to realize that I could do that, and when I realized that there are a lot of people that that are out there trying to have control and influence that do not even follow their own rules, I asked myself, why in the world should I do what everybody else is doing? Right. None of that makes any sense to me. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, uh, 
that's also how I came up with the the logo for PPAC Compass Publisher. It's a it shows the a 16th century compass, and then it's with on your Greek, book, right, right yeah. with with Greek lettering, and. I left the, uh, if anybody wants to know, I, I left the uh, word honor in the upper right, the English word, because if you translate it to Greek, it's shorter and just doesn't look as good. So, <laughs> but, um, and then underneath, of course, I have PPHC Compass Publisher. Yeah. Over a continental spread or, or map of the world, if you will. And so, can't remember what I was going to say. I like to, call, I like to call that cognitive distance feeling gazoo mind gremlins. <laughs> it happens to all of us, right? I mean, yeah. um, so, but you, you wrote the book too in a way to empower people. I mean, I, because uh, it, it's the sense that the power has been taken away from the people in essence, by giving them a sense of power, by giving them an illusion of power, by here's here's a transactional, here's money for a job done type type of sense of power, and then you can purchase anything you want. You can have whatever you want in that, like you said, game that we're, we're kind of playing. But it is, it's an illusion. And when you talk about going off road, I kind of understand um, what you mean there in terms of I can, I can take whatever path I want. It's it's the idea that I'm trapped on this path for whatever reason. Like I have to stay on this path because it's the one that I've been told to be on. It's the one where my bills are paid. It's the one where my family is. It's, it's, it's this one where it's kind of been conditioned. In right. Us, right. And the path, if we see the path, the path is simple. It's in front of us, but it, but it's also, it also doesn't lead anywhere. The, the influential path doesn't lead to right. the, the, it doesn't lead to the self fulfillment that we're looking for, right? Because of what we talked about um, of the the information sort of taking away a person's individuality, other than right. what they really are. Mm -hmm. And once that's displaced, then a person becomes more manipulable. Yeah. And right, because that, I mean, then we start poking at the things that interest them. It's right. like they're, they're hot buttons. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I, let's see, in one of the previous Twitter Periscope videos I did in explaining my book, I showed everybody um, Globe and this and I have this whenever I go to book signing events. And so the principle of the sphere, you know, I explain, imagine yourself, I mean, we live on a sphere anyway, right? Right. And so imagine yourself standing on top of your own uh, theoretical sphere. Okay. Or excuse as a speaking metaphorically. And so looking at a sphere from the side it looks like a circle right right well if you can get away from the idea of being put in a circle repetitiously and realize that your life is actually three-dimensional you have the power to go wherever you want forwards backwards right left um, heights, depths, and so um, when you go off road, you're not in the circle anymore. Mm -hmm. You are going wherever you want to on the sphere. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when people realize that they have lost control of themselves, um. I also explain when they read the portion in my book about different ways a person can use their compass. 
And I explained that the compass is in between, we're getting to a point here, that the compass is in between their heart and their mind. Yeah. And it's also part of the reason for the 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 logo for PPHC Compass. Mm -hmm. That there there is true north, magnetic north, and grid north. Okay. And I explain in my book that true north is an individual being true to themselves. When a person begins to realize that they are experiencing cognitive dissonance for the wrong reasons, and they start to look for their own compass, they realized, they might realize, my compass has become lost, or it's become buried, and I need to look for that. Because your own individual and personal compass always points to true north, which is your true self. Mm -hmm. And when a person begins the journey to look for themselves, their, their, their compass begins to be drawn out and they right. begin the process of repairing that compass. Yeah. And along the way they, which, which my book teaches, teaches people how to, how to think with the three different kinds of wisdom. And so using, I write the book in such a way that uses the chapters in tandem. They can go back and forth and it reiterates. And so using the book as a whole, the principle of the compass, the principle of the sphere, it gives a person back their individuality and power. Hmm. It's, I mean, it sounds like a spiritual journey. Back to the oneness of yourself. Right. Yeah. But using the compass as a metaphor for that that oneness with the, the universe or God or whatever it is. Yeah, wh whatever, whichever person or believes. Thing. Yeah. Right. And, and if you think about the, the word God, mm -hmm. you know, there we have all these different religions, right? Yeah. Well, God is a, a word in the most general sense. And even people of different religions, whatever their God's name is, they're still a God, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's, that's how I look at it. Other people don't have to, but I'm, that you reminded me of that whenever you said that. Well, it's true, though. I mean, and there's, there's so much fear based off of the word God because— of all the the things done in the name of God that were, you know, death and destruction and stealing and raping and killing and all this stuff done in the name of God that is like, well, I don't want to be associated with that, right? And we lose we lose our we do lose our way in a sense that that's not that's not the the essence, that's not the spirit of what it is. And trying to find our true spirit once again is something that becomes extremely difficult when there's so much other stuff to distract us, all of these other games that we were talking about to distract us from our true purpose here. Right. And so I also explain uh, what you just said. I even talk about that in my book. I yeah. even talk about an individual's purpose. And I also talk about that there can be multiple purposes. Yeah. For a main purpose or goal. And then once a person reaches that goal for their purpose, that's not the end. Because we're here to continuously learn, gain experience, and progress. Yeah. Not be in an endless cycle of digression or control. Right. Yeah, I talked about it before, uh, this idea of false finish lines in our life that as soon as we get to this thing, then I'll have exactly what I need to be complete. When in reality, there's no finish line. It's just, we, there's checkpoints along the way that we're reaching for, we're moving towards. Um, and all of life literally is just an experience. We're having an opportunity to experience so many different things. Sometimes they're really painful and miserable and scary and dark things. 
Right. And then sometimes they're the most beautiful, wonderful, luscious, like fantastic things we could ever imagine. But it's all part of the experience. Right. And I can imagine you being in, you, you were uh, an army veteran. Were you actively deployed? Yep. I, I was deployed to Iraq in 2004. Yeah. And so I say, if I remember right, in my book, I pretty much explained that, you know. That was the beginning right? of the war. That's, that's, 2004 was uh, that, first that's year actually, of war, right? That was actually year. 2001, if I remember right. So okay. that was still when things were pretty, 2004 was still when things were pretty, pretty heated. Intense. Yeah. And, um, but veterans, they have a unique perspective. Sure. You know, they deal with not only the, the military portion of, of experiencing things, but also the, the civilian portion. And I basically say in my book that I received an education there I could not have gotten anywhere else. Yeah. And it's true. And, and you ask any other veteran that's that's been to a place like Iraq or Afghanistan. And, you know, generally speaking you know, they could pretty much tell you the same thing. Well, I can only imagine the things. I, I just finished reading a book called Yellow Birds uh, by Kevin Powers. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but he was he was over in Iraq as well. Um, and he kind of recounts his, his story there. But I can only imagine the stuff that, as a human being, you know, it's like, okay, you're a veteran, you're a soldier, um, whatever. You're still a human being, right? And uh, have, experiencing things on a human level but in a mindset as a soldier, like you have to, you, I'm sure you had to have gone somewhere else to like you in mentally to, to be able to reconcile things for yourself, the things you saw that were happening and then be able to come back to humanity and find yourself again. Right. Because I can only imagine like having to lose myself as a soldier in that idea of killing and violence and seeing some of the terrible things that happen and then come back to that not being reality. Right. It's, that it's, makes definitely, sense. it's definitely an experience because, um, I've also been to South Korea twice. Okay. And each time I was sent overseas for various assignments, it was always a, a different experience. Yeah. Even my, my second deployment to South Korea, it was a different experience. And every time I came back to the States, um, it was always an adjustment. Yeah. Because like you, like you said, it, it is a, it is a totally different experience. It's a totally different world. But, but whenever you're in the military, you're not focused on a lot of the same nuances or, Things that would bother, you know, a, a regular civilian going right. about their daily lives. You know, mm -hmm. whenever you're in the military, you're you're focused on on the mission or right. various other side missions, and and you're 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 taught to pay attention to detail. You're you're taught to be driven. You're taught to take care of yourself as quick as possible. You know, and and every soldier is taught to be who and what they are as as a soldier to be a leader first mm -hmm. to take care of yourself as quick as possible so that so that and and to be prepared prior to take care of um your peers and those that you lead and right. and, and it's all for efficiency and effectiveness as, as the military way right. and so you're in this and that's 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 the reason for basic training Right. And that's why, you know, there's a common phrase they, they break them down to build them back up into something that they should be in a military and as part of a military or as right. a military. And that is completely different than, you know, a businessman or a lawyer or a doctor or even a police officer. Right. And because you always know in the back of your mind or wherever any other veteran places that that you are going to have to take uh, somebody's life 
or yeah. you're going to get in hand-to-hand -hand combat or you're going to have to uh, deal with other various types of adversity and trials that most other civilians would never even think of. Yeah. Your life is on the line literally all the time. Right. And so you have to not only th those things and all the responsibilities added to uh, you as a soldier whenever you become a leader or an NCO or an officer. Yeah. But if you have a family or if you have loved ones at home, you have to be able to take those things and, and put them somewhere in your mind, you know, and protect them. And you have to protect those things and your family or else or else you will not be able to focus on what you do, your mission. And if you're constantly worried about your family and those other things, then you're going to mess up. You're going to get hurt or you're going to get other people hurt. Yeah. And so um, it's always it's always about the mission, the mission, taking care of soldiers, troops, um, you know. Put putting other things bef before yourself, selfless service, selfless service, sacrifice, yeah. defending other people's freedom other than other than your own, giving up yourself so that other people can have freedom. Well, that's what I wanted to ask too. What, was that what brought you to want to join the military? Was it that sense of service and giving back? I mean, it sounds like it's a so, theme now for you. You want to be of service and give back. Well, was that before you got into the service? Um, I've had that ever since I was a little boy. I explained in my book that I was in Boy Scouts. I went to church. I was given leadership responsibilities whenever I was in church. I was uh, given leadership responsibilities, and I advanced in rank in the Boy Scouts. And so that was always a part of me. And then whenever I was in school, 9-11 happened, and I was angry. You know, previously yeah. I explained that, you know, groups such as the ACLU took away the the uh, Pledge of Allegiance in schools. Yeah. And that meant something to me as an individual. And so I was irritated about that whenever I was younger. And then especially whenever 9-11 happened, I was angry because that was similar to what happened at Pearl Harbor. Only it was a different attack. And... I felt also like they were attacking me and my freedom and I wanted to go I wanted to go fight. I wanted to go kick some butt, you know, yeah. and I wanted to contribute. And I wanted in a sense every military member every day that they go to work, all of their contributions, everything that they do helps incrementally and collectively give back and add strength to everybody else's freedom in this nation yeah, and other people that, that are not able to enjoy, enjoy those types of freedoms around the world. And I mean, I realized that some of those dynamics after I was in the military, but I guess you would say, or maybe to, to answer another perspective of your question is that that's another reason why I wrote the book because I was able to actually get and receive a lot of inspiration and drive and determination, knowing that I was defending others' freedom while I was in the military, that whenever I transitioned, retired, and I wrote this book, that, that those feelings transferred into what I wrote in my book. And I wanted to help people just as much. Yeah. And those convictions that gave me the drive and determination to do what I do, I mean, do what I did as a, a military military member and NCO transferred into some of the reasons why I wrote my book. Yeah. And I, mean, I feel just as strongly still. Okay. I was going to ask, uh, with the idea of transcendence, right, to live on a higher level of consciousness. Right. Do you, do you feel that war is necessary? Sometimes, yes, war is necessary. But if... In terms of... In terms of... And I agree, sometimes 
there are certain things that are necessary. But in terms of like your idea of trans transcending to a higher level of consciousness, which if I, I'm guessing it's not, I don't know if it's on the same wavelength of what I'm thinking of, but it, in that ideal, like if people are discovering who they are, their compass, you know, and coming back to their true sense of self, do you feel it's necessary in that world? Do you think it has a place in that world? Yes, it does. Because, okay. um, you know, I, I believe in spirituality. I believe there is a God. And there is not just one type of war. There's something called spiritual warfare. Right. And, and there is also war in the, the physical real world. I mean, right. we have, we as human beings, we have feelings for a reason. Mm -hmm. We we are individuals for a reason. We have the God-given rights of self and to have the ability to choose and to be free. Right. right. And for me, there's not only one way to fight for those things. And so giving back or articulating and explaining to people how they can regain their freedom and sense of self also opens up a way to learn combat in a spiritual sense. Okay. Because all of our thoughts, they're internal. Right. And it's what we refer to as the, the spiritual world. You know, and I guess you could take the word determination. When a person becomes determined, once they've figured out something for themselves, once they have had sort of a uh, mental breakthrough in their, their, their thoughts and their feelings, and they realize that they need to do something about whatever was in their way as a roadblock. They can use their new way of thinking. They can use the new knowledge and experience they've gained to help them move forward in determination and sort of fight to move forward and mm -hmm. realize that things are different now that they have this new knowledge and experience than what they were. Right. And I mean, if you were somebody that had those realizations wouldn't that make you kind of irritated if you realized that some of the things you thought were right were actually the things holding you back well i think um see i've i've, I've kind of come to a realization multiple times a lot of times in the past 10 months um this idea of of fighting of being driven of pushing forward um, has come more to me in a sense of surrendering what I thought what existed, like what I thought was me, what I thought was real, um, and learning a new perspective on it. I, I like to think of like if if I come to a roadblock or a wall and I can't punch through the wall, but I can I can become the wall. And in so doing, I can become the other side of the wall by having a new perspective on it, if that makes sense. But it, it's, 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 the same, it's kind of the same concept, just in a, in a different perspective, right? It's, it's, right. An interesting, it's an interesting conversation. Because you could, using perspective, you know, you could ask yourself, now... What makes this wall what it is? Right. What's the consistency? What's the substance in this wall? Right. Figuratively or metaphorically? Is right. this wall people? Is it ideologies? Is right. it myself that's holding me back? Is it, you know, and once you figure out what that wall is made of and you realize how that wall works. Right. You, be, you can begin to use your sphere, your compass, 
to either navigate through the wall, around the wall, Over or the like wall. you said, become the wall yourself and yeah. sort of turn everything inside out or on its head and tell people, look, I'm taking a stand. Right. I'm the wall now. <laughs> you know, you people aren't getting anywhere, you know, past me. You're not influencing me. I'm taking a stand. I'm standing my ground. Right. You know, like you said. So and I think it's important to be open to experience all of it. Right. I think the greatest thing I've learned is that I don't know a damn thing. <laughs> you know, the idea that I knew anything to begin with had to be broken in me because it was the thing that was killing me. The idea that I knew how everything worked and how things were going to be set, all these pillars that I had built my life on and were set, had me set up above other people needed to be torn down so that I could, that I could experience life the way it, it, it's meant to be experienced. And just like this reawakening of being the student always of, you know, of always being able to learn and being willing to be open to whatever idea it is without actually having to necessarily become the idea or like um, back the idea or, you know, push the idea on anybody, but experience it, gain perspective on it. In that I can, you know, I'm fluid and able to move in any, any direction and life becomes that eternal experience where, you know, nothing is out of the realm of possibility. And so God can show up for me wherever. There's, you know what I'm saying? Like God, and, and I believe God is either everything or he's nothing. And I believe God is in everything. It's just, am I willing to see it? Am I willing to observe where God is in the situation? Well, that's why I wrote the portion in my book called Have the, or, or about humility. Have the humility to start to stand and stand your ground and fight wherever your feet might be. Right. And I'm not saying that what you explained is wrong, but I think a lot of people, whenever they first start their journey, that's how they look at things, mm -hmm. which is which is correct. However, by making some mistakes, they soon realize that when they begin their journey towards self-actualization, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> finding their, their themselves using their compass, they become humble because, and at the same time, when they become humble, they become malleable. Right. They become a student, but they should not necessarily become anybody else's student. Some people are astute enough to see that another individual has begun their journey and they have become humble in their demeanor and their countenance or their aura. Mm. And some people, when they, whenever they see that in another individual, they will either help or take advantage another, of it. Right. Or another person will take advantage of it. So yeah. I think. When a person first begins, they need to also remember and realize that they are not necessarily anybody else's student. You can become your own student mm. or you should stay your own student. And well, that's what discipline that, is, self-teaching. Right. Yeah. And resolve. And so uh, if you allow yourself when you're at that stage to be to continuously be everybody else's student and allow yourself to be washed away or receive tons of information like the tidal wave I explained, mm -hmm. then you're going to end up the same where you began. That I mean the, the same place you began. And so you need to be able to sort of find those anchors or those portions in your in in your humility to where you can continuously stand your ground and at the same time be humble. And yeah. so I uh, also, I, th I believe people have confused the definition of meek with the word humble. Mm. Being meek means sort of being like a child. 
means being submissive right. to and people i think have misunderstood that to think that they should be submissive to other people and be open up to any and all ideas where in fact you should be only submissive to yourself and knowing that you do not know everything and whenever you have that self actualization of wait a second and this could be within a split second and that you do not know what you thought you knew in that moment you stand your ground and you receive uh you allow yourself to receive what's before you and if you determined if you determine in those moments whether the information you are receiving is good then you can tell yourself to continue to be submissive and teachable right and on the other other side if what's happening is bad you still can choose to be humble and uh, i guess it, it you know easy way to explain it is to you know just kind of be like okay i'm listening to what you're saying all right i don't really agree with you but okay i'm still listening you know right. and then, well. because if if a person isn't humble and then that could potentially get them in trouble that could they could become somewhat aggressive standoffish or offensive to the other person and then you are giving the power to the other person to manipulate right. and control you right and I, I think it's knowing yourself well enough to know that i can experience this thing without becoming the thing it's like water it's like being like water water can go into a glass take on the shape of a glass but it does not become the glass right it's still water and that's that's the kind of uh, place i come from is i can experience it i can i can see what what value it may hold intrinsically or where that that perspective is coming from without becoming the perspective myself without becoming the thing or or you know taking on the ideals of that thing that i intrinsically disagree with or whatever whatever it may be but that and that's something like i'm sure you talk about in the book about finding your compass finding the truest version of yourself having a, a reality of the truest version of yourself that when all that information does come in that we can hold on to who we are without being washed away you right can still you can still experience whatever is available whatever's out there you don't have to shut yourself off from anything and not lose who you are right yeah but it's it's all it's it's it, it can become difficult right especially just starting out on the right journey. right and when you start to look at those perspectives and the information and those experiences as a tool like you explained yeah. or how you how you just explained then you are still uh, an individual and you really do not give up your position right. like like this this object is a tool i right. use to explain things the the pencil you're holding in your hand is is a tool to help you do what you're doing you know, right. and even abstract concepts such as perspective is a tool. Right. Yeah, it's not me. It's yeah, it's something I use. Right. And I, it, it it does get lost sometimes. Um, all right, man. John and Chavez, thank you so much for coming. This has been an awesome conversation, dude. Really, really enjoyed talking to you. Um, a lot. It sounds like there's a ton of great stuff in the book. Freedom and the Will to Move Forward, A Compass for Today's World. It's available now. Um, you can get it on Amazon, also at pphccompass.com, your website. You are also uh, help build other people's websites, website design, all that kind of stuff. There's member, or, um, You've got shirts and fleeces and all kinds of cool stuff on the website you can purchase. All available now, and I'll have links in the description of the video. Um, Jamin, I do want to give you the last word, man, before we go. What do you got? 
Well, I would ask everybody to uh, buy your book, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. But, uh, you know, I'm sure that everybody's heard about conventional wisdom or the three types of wisdom. And so I would just ask everybody to give my book an opportunity. Because the whole purpose of the book is to help people regain their individ individuality and put the power back to themselves. So, and I just like helping people that way. Absolutely. And one I way. think, I think like we talked about before, anybody afraid of another opinion or another idea is simply afraid that they're going to lose themselves because they don't know who they are, you know? And I think a lot of that, it does come from a place of fear. It's like, I can't listen to anything else because I'm not even sure who I am. <laughs> what, if I <laughs> what if I become something else? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and my book, and the Will to Move Forward, aims to do, the purpose is the opposite. Right. To help people discover who they are. Right. Very cool, man. It's been great talking to you, Jamin. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, be good. Thanks, Matt. Take care. All right, brother.